Thank you. I can see you already. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, in Thailand. So we will start uh, at uh, another two minutes. Okay. Uh, five past one. So in case the, I can show you around the audience how it look like. Yeah, <laughs> there's an over old technology. Yeah, this is the, the attendance on on site, and uh, we have already Professor Hirono and uh, Professor um, Clyde Padit, Professor Wan Vimon with us, and also uh, Doctor Thirawat and Doctor Yawapha, the, the moderator. So we just wait for Doctor Yang to arrive. All right, uh, it's uh, five o'clock. Uh, it's one pa five minute past one. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Thanas Pong. Uh, in Thailand, we usually call by nickname because our name is a little bit too long and too difficult to pronounce. Uh, my nickname is Men. So I'm from the uh, Department of Marine Science, Faculty of Fisheries. Uh, today, it's my honor to be your MC this afternoon. Uh, uh, welcome everybody to the special seminar of the Faculty of Fisheries this year. Uh, this seminar is part of the 26th Annual Academic Conference uh, of Kasesa University. And uh, our faculty uh, was found together with Kasesa University 80 years ago. So it is very special occasion this year that we, our university and also our faculty celebrate 80 years of uh, being found. Okay. So uh, the special seminar will be about three hours. Uh, it starts from now to about 4 p.m. Uh, first, uh, uh, to start with, may, may I kindly invite Associate Professor Wan Chai Wara Matana Watana Meti Kunna, the Associate Dean for Research, to give the opening remarks. Thank you. Professor Hirono, uh, Dr. Wami Moon, uh, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to our activities this afternoon. This activity is part of our annual academic conference in which this year is the 61 conference since our university and faculty filed 60 years ago. Every year, the committee of organizing the academic conference recognized the importance of dissertation and promotion of advanced fishery research and technology, and our faculty of fishery 
international co collaboration to the faculty research com community and wide public. Therefore, we have uh, organized series of academic talks and seminars every year. For example, uh, we organize uh, the talk and seminar related to microplastic in uh, 2021. And uh, last year, about coming up disruptive technology in aquaculture and fishery. This year, we have been honored from reading researcher from our international collaborators from Japan, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, and from our faculty members uh, to provide example of their work on frontier fisheries research and technology toward well-being sustainability. Again, thank you for very much. I wish that our gathering today will deliver good activities and will be successful. And I can generate a lot of fruitful discussion and possible future collaboration which benefit us and society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor uh, Dr. Wan Chai. Uh, next, uh, I would like to introduce the speaker. Uh, so we have a speaker online today. There are three speakers online and uh, two speakers uh, on site. The speaker online uh, is uh, Professor Liu Yang from Ocean University of China. Dr. Heru Pramono from University of Air Lanka, Indonesia. Uh, Professor Ikuo Hirono from University, Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology, Japan. Dr. Yong Yik Sung, or uh, Professor Sunny from University of Malaysia. And Associate Professor Dr. Wan Vimon Klai Padit uh, from our faculty, Kasesat University. And we have privilege to have two moderators which is Assistant Professor Dr. Yawapa Waiprip from Department of Fishery Product and Dr. Thirawat Prairat from Department of Fishery Biologies. Without further ado, so let's start our seminar. So I will give the floor to, to the, the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind attention uh, and a kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, let me thank you and for coming here today. Our honorable speakers, distinguished professor from five world leading university, thank you very much for your kind acceptance to participate in our seminar. Our topic today is frontier fisheries research and technology towards well being sustainability. The seminar will be on-site and online hybrid conference platform. It will be divided into two sessions. Firstly, a 15-minute talk from each speaker and talk and take the question of the talk for about five minutes. And after that, it will be a panel discussion about 30 minutes. For on-site audience, you can raise your hand and ask the question directly, or you can hand on your question to our staff that sit around this in this room. For online audience, you can just leave the question in the chat box so that we can pick up and ask the question for you. Shall we start a talk with the utilization of the fish byproducts by Associate Professor Dr. Wan Wimon Krepadit? Dr. Wan Wimon, uh, as, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Wan Wimon Kevadit is currently the Associate Dean for International Affairs, Faculty of Fisheries, Kasetsa University. 
Her research mainly focused on the utilization of the fish waste to be used as functional ingredients in food and pet food, such as tuna blood powder and water soluble tuna calcium. She serves as the editorial members for Journal of Fisheries and Environment and Agriculture and Natural Resources, Okasek Sat University. Today, she is going to give the talk about characterization novel calcium compounds from fishbone byproduct and anti osteoporosis activities in MCTTT E1 cells. Everyone, please welcome Associate Professor Wan Rimon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Wawupa, very much for your introductions. Um, for, for my talk today, uh, it's like a joint research between Faculty of Fishery, Kasehstan University, and Print of Songkra University that, uh, sorry. Okay. ไม่รู้อ่ะนะอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอีกไหมอี
Uh, let's start with the introductions. Um, as you might know that Thailand is one of the leading country in fish processing for export. So um, the larger uh, productions, the higher byproducts. Uh, so far we call like uh, coal products uh, will be obtained. Uh, in this picture, you can see that approximately 40 to 55 percent are generated as uh, coal products uh, from the fish processing. And bone itself is one of the main byproduct from fish that approximately account for 15 to 20 percent. Um, anyway, it depends on the type of fish. When we look at the composition of fish bone, um, the most part of the composition of the bone is mineral. Uh, account for about 50 to 56 uh, percent. And the calcium alone um, takes about uh, 54 to 36 percent based on total ash content. So bone can serve as a promising source of calcium. At present, calcium deficiency is a worldwide problem in humans that cause osteoporosis and reduce bone mass. Uh, calcium in human diet may not be enough compared to the levels um, required by human body. Um, it plays an important role in the structure and uh, bone and teeth in human and also participate in many physiological activity in the human body, um, such as moderating muscle function and participating in blood coagulations. When we look at the composition of the fish bone, um, I would like to point out this one. Calcium hydroxyapatite is the main composition that we found in, in the bone of many types of fish. Calcium hydroxyapatite and this structure like this, uh, we call it as the HA. Uh, HA is the main component of bone from, from many natural bones, such as uh, bovine bone, uh, porcine bones, things like that. Basically, um, it's composed of calcium and phospholate to provide rigidity um, to the bone. Uh, anyway, the problem of the calcium hydroxyapatite that when we would like to apply the calcium hydroxyapatite in any kind of food or drink, it's quite hard to soluble. Uh, when it's like in this picture, when we took like a calcium hydroxide to disperse in water, it dispersed for a while. After that, it become precipitate later on. So um, for this problem or uh, dysfunction, like uh, insoluble in water of the calcium hydroxyapatite is quite difficult to apply in any kind of food or drink. So um, our objective, we would like to produce and collectorize suitable calcium compound from calcium hydroxyapatite of fish bone byproducts and to evaluate the calcium bioavailability and anti-osteoporosis activity of calcium hydroxyapatite, the structure hydroxyapatite in MC3, 3-3-E-1 cell. The name is really long. I cannot talk like uh, the cell, okay? Uh, <laughs> so first, um, let's start with how to produce the calcium hydroxyapatite. Uh, for preliminary uh, study, I took uh, many, many bones, I mean, from, from different types of fish, including skipjack, Nigeria pier, barracuda, flathead, uh, rainbow runner, uh, and so I, I, I took it and calcite it at 900 degrees C for five hours. Then we obtain this one, uh, calcium hydroxyapatite, or called HA, right? This one. Uh, then um, all the sample were determined for visual apparent, color, proximate composition, water solubility, and water activity. And look at the uh, this one, uh, the pox, uh, the visual apparent, and you can see that uh, L star is the lightness, the color of lightness. It's really high, more than more than um, 
most more, more than ninety percent, most of them. So it so it's very really lined, but um the redness and yellowness, which indicates at A star and B star value, uh were uh, quite low, which according to the visual appearance of the samples. Okay. Uh, for approximate composition, uh, you, you can see that the organic matter, I mean the protein content, fat content, after calcination, we cannot detect it at all. It's like uh, indicates at the uh, ND because it's gone by the 900 degrees C can destroy uh, all of them, okay? Uh, but look at the S content, it's decreased almost 100%, okay? Uh, that means the S content was increased and supposed to uh, contain very high mineral in there. Uh, okay, we we'll look at the yield, yield of hydroxyapatite. Uh, for the tuna, skipjack tuna, the uh, highest yield, almost 60%, followed by um, tilapia, fathead, runner, so and barracuda. But we look at the water solubility property. You can see that all very low, less than 0.3%. That means all of them cannot be soluble in water. Okay. So based on the yield, it's, it's not significant difference in water sobriety, but based on the yield recovery, um, so uh, we select the tuna bone for photo study. Um, so the next part, uh, we did how to synthesize the soluble calcium form. We, 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 we select the skipjack tuna bone and we cut and clean it and dry it at 105 degrees C for 12 hours to obtain the dry tuna bone powder as the uh, causing beef as the TB. After that, calcite at a 900 uh, degrees C for five hours to obtain the calcium hydroxyapatite or HA. Okay. After that, the HA was contained. Um, we, we, we add the hydrochloric acid. Um, then to get the structure, hydroxyapatite, chloride compound, or HACL. And another part, uh, to neutralize the solution with the sodium hydroxide to get the structure, hydroxyapatite, hydroxide compound, or HAOH. The most of them were added with citric acid or lactic acid at two molar and sterling for a while. Um, that we obtain the solution uh, with centrifuge to obtain supernatan and evaporated. The, Evaporated uh, press was dry at 70 degrees C for 12 hours that we obtained the structure hydroxyapatite called citrate compound. I'm gonna call it as HA citrate, okay? And another one, structure hydroxyapatite hydroxide lactate compound. Uh, I will call it uh, HA lactate, okay? Um, okay, I have four types of form, dry tuna bone, TB, HA, or calcium hydroxyapatite, um, hydroxyapatite citrate, and hydroxyapatite lactase for further study. Uh, we analyze um, what the property, including mineral profile, channel group, uh, water solubility, uh, crystal structure using HRD, and morphology uh, using uh, SEM EDX. Uh, for the result of mineral profile, uh, you can see that the highest quantity of the macro mineral every sample was calcium. You can see that uh, was calcium, followed by phosphorus because most of the mineral are the major source of the formation of fish bone. Moreover, the magnesium, potassium, and sodium were also found in our sample with different content due to the chemical formula of each compound. Um, the ratio between calcium per phosphorus is very important uh, because it is directly related to the calcium absorption and retention due to the laboratory mechanism. Um, which involves in the calcium and phosphorus hemostasis. Normally, um, the calcium per phosphorus ratio is recommended to be between one and two. Uh, and the results show that the HA, HA citrate, and HA lactate 
are in the range in the recommended range uh, 1.94 to pi to eight and two pi to four. Uh, we also found another micromural. Okay, um, the picture show the water solubility of calcium hydroxyapatite. You see, it's still really low, less than zero point five percent compared to the HA citrate and HA lactase. That show very, very high solubility, more than ninety percent. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. We 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 test for the functional group, the three compound. You can see that for HA, um. The HA was quite different from HA citrate and HA lactate. With two, two of this compound were similar, okay, but totally different from uh, HA. That means uh, the some functional group were already changed, and um, we confirm the crystal structure of the compound. Uh, what's in there? It's like uh, for HA. This one is for HA. Uh, we can confirm that it had the hydroxy appetite with hexagonal crystal, right? And for uh, HA citrate, we confirm that it's what the uh, calcium citrate, theta hydrate, okay? Um, the, this one, HA lactase, the, the crystal was in the form of uh, calcium lactate, pentahydrate, okay? Uh, when we look at the uh, microstructure, I took the sample of SA citrate to look for the microstructure using the SEM uh, EDX. You can see the granules of the calcium compound, like a lab surface. And uh, when you look at the elemental mappings, you can see this one, different color. Uh, it indicates that there are some minerals like calcium, sodium, chlorine, phosphorus, potassium, carbon, like uh, distribute, distribute on the surface of the calcium powder to confirm that, okay, this powder uh, is real, is, it, it has its content calcium and phosphorus in, in the powder that we produce, okay? Uh, proof with the SEM uh, EDX. Okay, uh, next part that uh, this part, uh, Dr. Vanina from Print of Songkha helped us to, to test that. We don't have the uh, cellular lab uh, at our faculty and we send the sample to be tested at the uh, PSU. Thank you very much. Uh, first, we need to uh, make sure that uh, every sample is safe for the cell. We use the um, MC3, 3, 3E1 cell, it's like a bone cell to, to be test. And we use the concentration of sample 0 to 500 microgram per uh, milliliter uh, to test at 24, 48, and 72 hours. And use the MTT assay. And the uh, absorbent was uh, determined as 570 nanometer and uh, calculate for the cell viability in percent. Okay. Normally, um, if the cell viability higher than 70%, we can say that, okay, it's safe. Okay, it's safe for the cell, it not damage the cell at all. When you look at the concentration of our compound, all the compound, and compare with calcium carbonate also, HA, HA citrate, and HA lactate are all safe because cell variety higher more than 90% for all sample for every concentration. Okay, that means, okay, safe for cell not toxic at all. Okay, after that, what we did, after we know that, okay, the compound itself for the cell, so uh, we test if all the compound can finitase, can minitase across the intestinal tail, intestinal in, in intestinal tract, if can be absorbed 
and when absorb how many percent that can be absorbed how many percent the calcium magnesium and mineral can accumulate in the cell okay we determine using the trans epithelial electrical resistance or tier value the higher tier value that mean uh, the higher that the cell can across the cell but this one because uh, we use the cargo two cell different cell is not the bone cell because when 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 the when the nutrient going to be absorbed we can use the intestinal cell to be absorbed okay uh, when we look at the tier value you can see that uh, at 30 and 45 minutes all the compound had very high tier value and significantly different from the control and you can see this one is the control on the uh, compound have very high tier value. That means uh, all the other compound can be absorbed, can be across the intestinal cell. Okay. And uh, when you look at, we, we check for the contents of calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. You can see that the calcium, phosphorus, magnesium can accumulate in the cell also for of HA, HA citrate, and HA practice. Okay, so the finding from trans epithelial transport call um, efficiency in cargo to cell demonstrate that um, hydroxyapatite, hydroxyapatite citrate, hydroxyapatite lactase could be absorbed at the intestinal tract. Okay, next, anti osteoporosis. Okay, um, okay, when it can trans, uh, trans cross the intestinal cell, after that, we test if the compound has the anti osteoporosis efficiency uh, that we compare with the DEXA. You can see that DEXA will got, um, inhibit and separate cell proliferation and cell differentiation of ATP activity compared with this one. HA, HACL, HAOH when in deal with DEXA. Uh, DEXA has no effect on this one and it can promote the cell differentiation and cell proliferation of the cell. Okay, you can see that. It's not different between uh, the sample compared to the control. Okay, um, this one, may, may, many names, uh, this name is like a equation genes uh, in the calcination and metric maturation. The results show that all the sample uh, can have the effect to the gene expression compared to the dextra. Also, the, for the AL, uh, ALP, A, ALP, uh, collagen uh, 1 alpha in the mineralization step and have impact on the TC for the cell differentiations. Okay. Uh, and this one is the uh, microscope photograph of erisalin red staining. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see that when we use the HA, right, hydroxyapatite, HA citrate, and HA lattice. So uh, in the red color, it was similar to the control. What it mean? It means that the cell can accumulate the calcium, okay, compared to uh, when we use DEXA. When we use DEXA, you can see just a uh, little uh, red color appear. Okay, and uh, this one show the calcium deposition or accumulation in the cell. You can see that when we use the HA, HA uh, citrate, HA lactase, it has very high calcium decomposition in the cell compared to the dextra metasome. Okay, uh, in summary, I uh, can say that uh, structure hydroxy compound, hydroxy citrate, uh, hydroxy lactate show very high water solubility than uh, uh, calcium hydroxy appetite 
uh, the mineral element from hyoscine, hepatite, citrate, and lactase could be absorbed through the cargo to cell in uh, the promotion of the osteogenetic differentiation in MC3, 3E1 cell, and water soluble form of HA citrate and HA lactase show the anti osteoporosis advent as the calcium hydroxy appetite. Um, that I present is like uh, I make a summary from from three publications that I uh, just published. So if you would like to know more detail, because I just make like uh, the important thing, you can follow my publications. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Wan Rimon. Um, it is very interesting that we can convert calcium at the first place, uh, which is uh, not water soluble, to become water soluble, and then um, we can use it more easy. I mean, it can be absorbed more easier in our body. Um, is there any question from the floor? How about online audience? Is there any question? Okay, please. Okay, <laughs> can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much for very interesting. Uh, I would like to ask about or, or share some ideas about how how you decide uh, the tuna bone from, from the, the kind of, in the first time you show the first experiment that you have a lot of kind of fish, right? And um, what, what criteria that you decide to select the tuna? Because uh, I'm thinking about Thailand, if, if we, we, we find some kind of native fish or some kind of commercial fish that we have a lot of bones and it should be more practical in the future. I, I think that. And so I would like to ask about your criteria to select the tuna and how about the, the, the second one or the better one from Thailand? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, we, we select tuna for, from this study Actually, I, I did almost every every bone, but for for this experiment, I would like to to show that the the tuna had very high yield of the hydroxy appetite from this this one. They get very high yield of hydroxy appetite compared to the others. So um, the tuna is the is the byproduct is the main byproduct from candid tuna processing, which is the main the the main um fish products that's export, that's export, that we have tons of the bone generates every day. So it's very easy to, to get the bone from the candid tuna processing, very easy to get that. And we have many, many, many like uh, tons of them, of the bone to obtain every day. If the, um, if the processing, if, if, if the industry would like to create, to produce the calcium from the tuna bone. So it has no problem with the raw materials at all. And the tuna bone itself, they have very high uh, I don't see appetite. Also, when we look at the, the ratio of the calcium, we see that the calcium per phosphorus is very suitable. Under the recommendations of the calcium per phosphorus, it should be uh, one to two, thing like that. So it's a perfect, and the structure is quite similar to the human bone. So 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 why? I, I think the the amount of raw material is very important to consider that first, and the property itself of the tuna bone is very suitable if the uh, instructor also would like to utilize and to uh, to do more to sell about the calcium. I think the material from tuna is the suitable choice. Anyway, I, I did it with therapy also. The, the therapy, I, I, I did it and determined this is quite a property also. 
so so I think um the bone from fish are very good. Are very good one. Okay. But but uh so far I think the tuna bone is uh very suitable in in terms of the amount of sample. Thank you. Um I I will have one quick question. Um what is the feasibility to produce uh calcium, this soluble uh, water soluble calcium in a larger scale? In the large scale? Yeah. Uh I think we, we, we can do in the uh, the large scale. Actually so far one company in Thailand they already sell the calcium from from fish bone but not in the soluble form. So um but because uh, the step of processing is not it's not too complicated. We we can upscale from the 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 method and the equipment that we use. We we, we have the equipment that have the the large scale that uh, can be applied. Actually, it commercialized already. What 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 is it? Uh, this one we just do the calcinations. Calcination. You 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 can use an equipment uh to is like to burn it. Uh, for 500 degrees C is already in the market already. And um, actually, if you would like to do add the soluble calcium for myself, I think we the industry can can adapt can adjust to make it faster by using the spray dryer. Because in my lab scale, I use like a hot air oven. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh took some time it's like a uh, uh, 10 hours, it hours. Hour. It takes long, longer time. time. If uh, we can change to you like a spray dryer, it's, it's safe. Yeah, yeah it's, it's safe. The cost and save time, mm -hmm. and we can do like a mass production. Mm -hmm. I, spray dyeing. I, I, spray I, I, I have been working on it so far. You mean spray dyeing? Spray dryer. Mm -hmm. To yeah. obtain the, the high yield. Yeah, maybe we have to think about the cost of right, right, right. This machine we can adjust the, the the method, and um, as as I try it, success ah. is it can do that. that okay, that very. But this one is already published, so that show the publication one. All right, okay. yeah, it's very practical, and then we can just um produce it at a larger scale as well. Yes. So, all right. Thank you very much because the time is up. And uh, so that, thank you very much, Professor. Let's keep it perfect. So we move to the next speaker who is going to give us some idea about uh, using waste, seafood waste as a nitrogen source for peptidase production. Dr. Heru Pramono. Are you there? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, um, okay. Dr. Heru Pramono is currently a lecturer at the Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Universitat, Universitat, Alanka, Indonesia. His research mainly focuses on the utilization of fish waste to be used as a natural food additive in fish products for a safety aspect such as um, protein isolate, hydrogen, lactic acid bacteria, and also today he is going to uh, give us some idea about the uh, production of uh, peptidase enzyme from the seafood waste. Please welcome Dr. Pramono. Do you see my slides? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you for your uh, chance to me to deliver this uh, share from uh, from our experiments. Uh, actually, uh, first, I would like to clarify that I'm still uh, in the last year of my doctoral degree, so not yet a doctor, but I hope to I can graduate this year, and then. 
uh, in this in this section, I would like to share about uh, uh, seafood waste as nitrogen source for Preptides reduction. And then this is the summary of my overview about this uh, idea. First, we have the, so many seafood in the, uh, seafood industry is produce so many various ways uh, we we put we, we put up a uh, statement here because actually it is a byproduct not not the waste itself it is consists of the head skin frame bone which is still contain nutrients and also uh, it is suitable for microbial growth another note is it is cheap easy and easily obtained and produced uh, every day like like uh, uh, previously mentioned by Professor Wang And on another hand, microbial peptides is less complex in structure, quickly biosynthesized by microbial, and then high demands, and depend on the nitrogen source as substrate to produce. So what can be done from those two ideas, uh, two facts that are already done? In our, in our laboratory, we think about the proposed uh, design to make the sustainable produce waste valorization. So we start from what problem or what the challenge, and then we move into the what the products that will key will be will be developed, and then after that we try to produce that one, and optimize the yield of the product. Came back once again to what the problem challenge, and then this will be some uh, you know like like cycles to make some. Uh, uh, clear, clear idea to make what product that will be uh, solve the problem itself. Uh, this is the out outline of our, my presentation. First. What is the seafood waste itself? Based on the source itself, it is can be separated into two kinds of waste. First is by catch, and the second is by product. By catch is seafood waste that came from the catching itself. It is noted that 10 until 30 percent of the catching recently in the worldwide is become you imagine if in in the world is can produce one day around this it is will be wasted into the sea and it will become, become problem and then the second source is a uh, byproduct this is came from the industry for example like head or skin or the bones that already presented previously by professor Wamimo. it is 30 until of the seafood waste itself. In the fact is, it is still containing many various nutrition or for another idea. For example, like proteins, lipids, minerals, and then it is open possibility, open opportunity for us to do the experiment, make it a uh, uh, to offer is grown rapidly, but the food itself, what the source of the nature itself, to be food for, for the peoples. The characteristic character. Recession of the uh, uh, seafood waste itself. It Stop, Stop. Stop. Um, no, sorry that I interrupt you. Can can you just turn? Nice so, oh. in and well, how do you know? Doctor Parmano, please. I'm sorry that to interrupt you. Um. Because now the connection is not very stable. Comedy in the, the consumer perspective. Dr. Primer, no. Can, can you hear me? So, 
we need to. Not the timer, no. Can you hear me? Yes. Can, can you hear me? The, the connection yes. from you is not very yes. stable, so I think you can turn off your camera. You can turn off your camera, maybe it's better. Can you hear me? So, sorry. Okay. Um, so. Okay, can, can you hear me? Can you please turn off your camera? Because the connection is not very, the signal is not very stable. Right? I'm still there, right? Still, where, where? I see. Hi there. So, maybe we can just move to the next speaker. Yes, and then if he can show up, we can talk about it later. So the next speaker is our professor Ikuo Hirono. He is a professor in genome science um, laboratory, graduate school of marine science and technology, Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology. His research mainly engaged in the cross research of fish genomics, especially for controlling infection disease aspects. He has published more than 428 articles, 400 articles in international peer reviewed journal with an H index of 61. He is co editor in chief of Fish and Tail Fish Immunology, Associate Editor of Review in Fisheries and Fish Biology, Associate Editor of Fisheries Science, uh, Editorial Board Member of Journal of Fish Disease, Editorial Board Member of Fish Pathology. Everyone, please welcome <laughs> Professor Iono. Thank you very much for your kind introductions. How to start? Mm -mm. Sorry, it's okay. Start yet? No, 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 no. From the first, first. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to say thank you to the organizing committees for giving me a chance to talk uh, today's uh, seminar. Okay, so the topic of my talk is uh, controlling the infectious disease in shrimp uh, farming. So as you know, uh, in the global shrimp aquaculture productions, quickly, very fast, uh, increasing year by year. Uh, this data is a little bit old. So that, uh, in the world, the shrimp business is very good business. However, uh, during the uh, growing of shrimp aquaculture, there are several uh, uh, infectious diseases all over the world. Most of them are virus infections. And some of them are like a WSSV. Uh, this virus infection is a still problem all over the world. 
uh, shrimp are, are farming. So, uh, we have to increase more and more uh, aquaculture productions because the world population is growing. So for increasing uh, aquaculture production, we have to combat with uh, pathogens, infectious diseases in aquaculture. So how to fight infectious diseases in aquaculture? So first we should identify the causative agent of infectious disease. Then uh, we should develop a diagnosis method. And then uh, also parallelly, we should study pathogenicity of infectious disease, identification of the virulence factor of pathogens. Uh, for this, maybe we should study the uh, whole genome of pathogens. In addition, uh, for development of uh, di uh, sorry, uh, prevention method against infectious disease, uh, we should study the immune response of uh, host animals. Then, uh, all together, we, I think uh, we can develop uh, a pre uh, preventive method against infectious disease. But due to the time limitations, Today, uh, I'll focus the last two topics and briefly so the, uh, to study uh, immune response of host animals. We need uh, molecular tools for studying the immune system of uh, your interesting uh, animals, in case of meat shrimp. So, uh, we conducted uh, genome analysis, transcriptome analysis of Kuruma shrimp, Penis japonicus. Uh, th this shrimp mainly found in Japan, China, and Australia. So uh, we collected uh, several uh, molecular tools for understanding the immune reaction of the shrimp. And uh, we already published our uh, papers in the last year. Uh, two year sorry, two, two years ago, yes. And uh, uh, I don't uh, tell you in details today about uh, uh, our genome studies of the uh, kuruma shrimp, but uh, we succeeded to collect uh, most of all the uh, kuruma shrimp genes uh, using the genome sequence and uh, transcriptome study using these uh, tissues and organs. So now we, we have uh, several molecular tools or uh, sequence of genome and genes. Next, uh, hemocyte, shrimp hemocyte. Shrimp hemocyte is an uh, important uh, immune system players inside of shrimp. The hemocyte has uh, several functions. Releasing antimicrobial peptide protein or phagocytosis, encapsulation and nodulations. However, uh, we don't know how many different types of hemocyte in shrimp. Some uh, paper said using uh, staining of the hemocyte, there are three types of the cells or, or hemocyte in Plastacians, uh, granule cells, semigranule cells, and hyaline cells. But the staining uh, hemocyte is not easy. So we need a molecular tools. So uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Koiwai, assistant professor of uh, my university, he, uh, he conducted a single cell analysis. Uh, so he isolated the several uh, hemocyte and then conducted uh, transcriptome analysis. So he conducted a transcriptome analysis uh, of hemocyte uh, to over uh, 2,500 uh, hemocyte individually and then analyzed. So the, uh, his uh, analysis suggested uh, kuruma shrimp has uh, at least six different types of hemocytes. Then next, uh, we, also, we also studied 
the hemocyte in the circulating or hemocyte in gill, heart, or other uh, tissue organs. All the hemocytes have a similar function or not. We don't know. So uh, we, collect, we collected the hemocyte from gill, heart, and the lymphoid organ, and then we conducted the transcriptome analysis. I'll show you some of the results. Uh, in this study, we use uh, three uh, individual shrimp. And all the three, three individual shrimps, uh, hemocyte from the heart, uh, gills, uh, the expression patterns are quite similar. Okay. Then uh, we analyzed what genes are expressed, transcribed in the hemocyte, uh, circulating hemocyte, gill hemocyte, heart hemocyte and lymphoid organ hemocytes, okay? Uh, some of the clotting-related genes mainly expressed in circulating hemocyte and not in the heart hemocyte or lymphoid organ hemocyte. In case of the leg chain, there are several different types of the leg chain in shrimp. And uh, uh, different types of the lexins expression patterns are different. And the different uh, hemocyte. So the circulating hemocyte, gill hemocyte, the expressing uh, type of the lexins are different. Uh, uh, hemocyte in the heart also are different. Hemocyte in the lymphoid organs also are different expression of lexins. So, uh, based on our studied uh, uh, shrimp, have uh, at least six different types of the hemocyte, and the circulating hemocyte and the hemocyte in the tissues. The gene expression patterns are different. So uh, these results suggested the uh, hemocyte in the different tissues or organs may have uh, different functions. Of course, we need more studies. And we also studied the phagocytic activity of the hemocyte. Uh, we, in, sorry, we injected uh, uh, magnetic uh, microbes uh, with a fluorescence. So uh, this fluorescence, uh, you can easy to see the uh, fluorescence microscope like this. And also uh, this uh, bees containing a magnet. So you can isolate the hemocyte having these uh, magnet microbes. So then uh, we uh, separated uh, a hemocyte having these magnetic microbes and then conducted uh, transcriptome analysis. So this study also indicated that phagocytic uh, cells and uh, no uh, phagocytic cells, the uh, gene expression patterns uh, were different. Like this. And in addition, uh, in uh, phagocytic cells, we found there are two different, at least two different types. Uh, we use uh, anti-integrating antibodies to distinguish the phagocytic uh, cells. However, interestingly, you can see these cells or these cells are positive to uh, integrating alpha. However, this uh, hemocyte having uh, microbes but a negative of uh, integrating alpha. So, uh, these uh, studies indicated that in a phagocytic uh, hemocyte shrimp, there are at least two types. Okay, so uh, still we are studying about uh, shrimp immune system. But parallelly, uh, we are trying to develop a prevention method against infectious disease. Uh, so how to fight infectious disease in aquaculture? So the shrimp have several net immune systems. However, shrimp have often or always lost the fight against infectious disease. So this indicated that shrimp immune system, 
doesn't work for fighting to pathogens. So the shrimp need someone's help to fight the pathogens. So who will help shrimp from pathogen infections? So one is uh, beneficial microorganisms. So the beneficial microorganisms will help shrimp pairs. However, there are several different types of microorganisms are living in pond and inside of the shrimp. So uh, we thought that some of them will help shrimp from pathogen infections to fight pathogen in shrimp. Uh, microorganisms, such as beneficial microorganisms, will produce something inhibiting uh, factors for uh, infection or growth or, uh, sorry, antimicrobial compounds. Or uh, product uh, from the beneficial microorganisms will stimulate or activate shrimp immune system. Then shrimp will become resistant to pathogens. There are several ways uh, to combat uh, infectious disease in shrimp. So the what is a beneficial microorganism? There are many different bacillus, lactic acid bacteria, are famous and popular for using as a probiotics in the livestock and also in aquaculture. But you know the uh, lactic acid bacteria, there are many different genus or species. Oops. And uh, photosynthetic bacteria. This also known as uh, beneficial bacteria, microorganisms. So some of the uh, photosynthetic bacteria produce a kind of the immune stimulant or antiviral substances. However, in the PSB also there are so many different genus or species. And the characteristics of the uh, bacteria vary in the ability according to strain, not species. Even the same species, each strain have a different uh, character or characteristics. Like as a human, you and I looks different like this. So the bacteria also, the, each strain have different characters. So, I think you can easy to understand very how difficult to identify the good or beneficial microorganisms uh, for using aquaculture. But we should try to find. Uh, for example, in case of these uh, pictures, uh, we uh, used uh, bacillus, six strain. The species are the same. Okay? And then uh, we studied anti vibrio activity. You can see. Uh, a shows the strong uh, activities against or inhibiting the growth of Biblio. However, strain F or G weak compared to strain A. So if you want to use uh, Biblio infections, so the first choice of the strain should be A. In addition, you should know the functional intestinal organ structure of shrimp. Shrimp uh, intestinal uh, organ structures are same with mammals or not. Because uh, most of the research uh, of uh, probiotics use mammals. So the, uh, most of the uh, researchers in aquacultures uh, they use uh, reference papers of mammals research. In, so in case of the mammals, uh, I didn't explain you in details, but as you know, in case of the mammals, intestine is one of the most important ones uh, for communications between the bacteria and immune system. However, in case of uh, invertebrate animals, in intestine, there is a chitin barriers. 
So, the bacteria inside of the intestine and the host immune system cannot communicate in intestines. So, in case of uh, invertebrate, like a uh, shrimp, the stomach is more important place for communications between bacteria and host immune system. Because as I told you, in uh, intestine, there is a chitin barriers. So the uh, functional organ structure of the mammals and our support are not the same. So the do probiotics help shrimp immune system, we should study. Uh, in the first study, uh, we use uh, this uh, bachelor's strains. And uh, this bachelor's strains has a strong activity against uh, fusarium. This is a fungi. You can see here is a bachelor's strain. Here is a fungi, uh, fusarium. Fusarium cannot grow along the, uh, these bachelors. And uh, this, this bachelor also Growth inhibiting activity against uh, Biblio uh, parahemolyticus append strains. So, the, uh, near the, this bachelor strains, uh, Biblio paras growth uh, uh, inhibited. I also study another other uh, bachelor species, but uh, these uh, three different bachelor species do not have the activities to uh, inhibit the growth of Biblio. Then we use uh, this bachelor's strains as a feed additive. And the feed two weeks, and then conduct the challenge test. In case of the serum infections, so the control shrimps go diet, uh, nearly the 80%. But feeding these uh, probiotics bacteria, mortality is uh, significantly low compared to the control groups. We also conducted the Biblio para append strain challenge test. This uh, probiotics feeding shrimps, the survivors are very good compared to the control groups, like this. So we also studied what happened in, inside of the shrimp. Then uh, first we study the number of the Biblio between the, uh, this probiotic feeding shrimp and control group. So the, in the stomach, before feeding many uh, Biblio, but after one week feeding of this probiotics, number of the Biblios significantly decreased like this. But in intestine, not much different. We also study the metagenome uh, in the uh, stomach or meat gut of the shrimp before and after the, uh, this probiotics feeding. The feeding of this probiotics, the uh, bacterial flora in the stomach were changed like this before and after. You can easy to see the different colors. So the different colors indicate the different uh, bacterial uh, genus. So the feeding these probiotics change the bacterial flora in the stomach of shrimp. So we already reported these studies. Uh, the first author is a Dr. Imaizmi. Now he's in these rooms and he's doing the postdoc uh, of the Dr. Sashimana's uh, Faculty of Science. So if you are interested in this research, uh, you will communicate or contact uh, Dr. Imaizmi. Thank you. Uh, due to the time limitation, I skip this. Okay, so next, the photosynthetic bacteria. Uh, photosynthetic bacteria, uh, some of uh, produce uh, five amino or levulinic acid. This is a non protein amino acid residues. And uh, this five LA are uh, already known as uh, a kind of the immune stimulant in mammals. So uh, we used this shrimp. Sorry. So uh, we use this fiber as a feed additive, uh, feeding for two weeks, and then conduct the challenge test. 
uh, using a Biblio para up and strains, feeding uh, five areas, the mortalities, uh, significant low compared to the control groups. So, uh, in case of the five areas, feeding uh, shrimp become resistance to Biblio para. However, uh, feeding five areas, shrimp uh, did not resistance to uh, WSSV or uh, Fusarium. And feeding these uh, five areas stimulate some of the immune related genes that we already published. And the next, uh, PSV culture as a feed additive. The previous one, we use a 5 array from the PSB. And the next study, we use a whole PSB culture. And in this study, we, uh, in the beginning, we used uh, about uh, 20 different strain of PSB. And then we chose one. And the feeding this uh, shrimp became a resistance to WSSV. Fortunately, but not to uh, Biblio para apensurin, uh, not to uh, Fusarium. And the feeding this uh, PSB culture uh, stimulate uh, similar uh, gene expressions. And uh, in the gear, some of the immune related gene expressions increased. And the last topic is a lactic acid bacteria. There are several different uh, genus. In this study, uh, in the beginning, we used uh, more than 40 different uh, lactic acid bacteria strains. And then uh, we selected one. Then uh, we used uh, this lactic acid bacteria uh, culture as a feed additives. And unfortunately, uh, feeding of this lactic acid bacteria should become resistant to Biblio para append strains. And uh, feeding uh, these uh, lactic acid bacteria, uh, several gene expression patterns were changed. So uh, feeding uh, lactic acid bacteria culture supernatant uh, shrimp became resistant to uh, Biblio para append strain. And uh, feeding of this, uh, some of the gene expression were changed. So feeding this lactic acid bacteria stimulate something of shrimp. But we still don't know the uh, mechanisms because uh, feeding the probiotics uh, bachelors uh, shrimp became resistant to fungi and the bacteria, but not to WSSV. And the feeding of the PSB, uh, shrimp became resistant to WSSV, but not to uh, Biblio or Ausarium. And the feeding uh, lactic acid bacteria, uh, today I didn't show you, but feeding lactic acid bacteria, shrimp became resistant to Biblio para and also uh, slightly resistant to WSSV. So it's uh, very difficult to understand the mechanisms. And the uh, change gene uh, also different in uh, PSB feeding and lactic acid bacteria feeding. But something happened in inside of the shrimp. So maybe trained immunity. Of course, we need more study. So take home message. So the beneficial microorganisms can help shrimp against pathogens. Beneficial microorganisms are not medicines. Do not expect beneficial microorganisms to be like antibiotics or vaccine. To use beneficial microorganisms will be better than nothing. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hirono, for your interesting presentation. Today, you talk about the hemocyte of the trim, which is very interesting. We often assume that all hemocytes are the same, like a white blood cell in the human cell, human body, or the fish body. But you prove that trim has different type of hemocyte, which is very interesting. Six types of them. And hemocyte in each organ also have different function. 
And in the second part, you talking about the probiotics, which is also an interesting topic in the trim aquaculture, because now today everyone know trim production has suffered infectious disease, which caused economic loss. And the probiotic is not not only species specific, but also strain specific. And you prove that some species of bacteria produce beneficial effect on the growth rate of survival and the immunity of the trim. Thank you very much for your interesting, again, presentation. And it is now to uh, have some question. If anyone have any question for about this topic, please feel free to ask the speaker. Please. Okay, can you hear me, Professor Hirono? It's very nice, interesting, very interesting. Um, I'm not in quite in this field, but I'm studying in sediment pollution and sediment microorganism. So I I feel impressed your words that you say that we still don't know what can stimulate the shrimp immunity. So I I in fact I have. Uh, not I don't know is question. I have two two questions and two opinions. Um, the first one is that um, in in your experiment, some experiment you show that control and the treatment had no difference in two weeks before about 14, 14 days. In the first fourteen days, they show nothing different. So I I feel that in the time. Have you ever checked all the shim that have treat and control? What about the inside of their body had some different? And it's my first. I think at that fourteen days, it's quite um, healthy of the the shim. It, it, it try too much to help protect themselves. And uh, the second question is about um, photosynthetic bacteria. I feel that I, I and I don't exactly don't know if it is aerobic or an aerobic bacteria. But anyway, in Thailand, we we have a uh, new technology to to uh, how to say to spray the sheet plastic sheet or of cover the sediment and try to keep uh, the the shim to not attach to anything. But for me, it is possible that if we protect something too much. It will be weaker. So this is my question. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your questions. Uh, the first, uh, we have to study uh, what happens uh, during the first two weeks. And in this study, we, in our study, we usually use uh, two weeks uh, for the feeding, but. Uh, we are planning to do short time feeding. For example, the uh, three days feeding and then conduct the challenge test or just one day. So how many days uh, shrimp need to become uh, strong uh, against uh, pathogens? So uh, this is an ongoing study. Maybe next year uh, I can uh, show you the, some of the results. So what happens uh, in inside of the shrimp at the beginning of the feeding of some of the probiotics or uh, lactic acid bacteria? We still don't know, sorry. And uh, the second question, um, uh, uh, in case of the PSB, as I told you that in case of the PSB study, we started to use uh, more than 20 different strains, about the same the species. But the, uh, the characteristics are very different. Characteristics means uh, against the pathogens. So this is also uh, not yet studied, but uh, I'm planning good uh, PSB and a not good PSB, but the same species. We can analyze the whole genomes and then compare the differences of the good PSB and not good PSB. And in addition, in case of the good PSB, it's depending on the culture medium or culture conditions. 
So even the same strains of the PSB, if we, we use uh, different uh, culture conditions, or different, uh, different culture condition means a different medium or aerobic or anaerobic, the activity were different. This is also quite interesting. So I uh, told you that uh, the same species, but the characteristics are different. And in case of the bacteria, it's in also uh, influence the culture conditions. I, I have a little bit question that you talk about trend immunity. May you please explain more about the trend immunity that you show in your slide? Okay, so uh, as you know, the vertebrate animals, like uh, humans, we have uh, adaptive immunities. We have a T cell and a B cell. Such a cells recognize uh, pathogens, and also they have a uh, memory cells. This is a, a, a vertebrate adaptive immunities. But in in vertebrate animals, they do not have a adaptive immune system like a vertebrate animals. But based on the several experiment. Uh, Maybe invertebrate animals have some uh, something similar to the adaptive immune system of vertebrate. And the trained immunities is uh, based on the uh, repeat meeting with the pathogens or something. So uh, survived uh, in case of the uh, Pathogen infections, some of the uh, individuals will survive. So such uh, survived animals not exactly memorize the pathogens, but such as sub, uh, survived animals memorize something of the pathogens. It's a kind of the training. So uh, for aquaculture, we do not necessarily to use uh, real pathogens. We can use uh, some molecules and uh, similar to the pathogens. And then uh, feeding or treatment of the fish or shrimp once a week or every day. So such animals, uh, kind of the immune system, will memorize such uh, molecules. Then, when the real pathogen came into their bodies, uh, their immune system quickly uh, responds to the invaded immune system. So the mechanisms are uh, completely different between the tolerant immunity and adaptive immunity of vertebrate. And the recently, the, the, there are several uh, publications said that uh, vertebrate animal also uh, uh, Torenit immunity. And the Torenit immunity is not always change the gene expressions. Okay. Thank you very much for your good answer. It's very clear. Uh, so they, today we go to the next uh, speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So, next speaker is Professor Dr. Yong Yik Soon. Professor Do Dr. Yong Yik Soon is currently the di director of the Institute of Marine Biotechnology, University, Malaysia, Triangle. His research mainly focused on gym immunology, application of heat chalk protein for disease control as well as application of live food organism for immune enhancement in aquaculture. To date, he has published more than 120 articles with an H index of 18. He also served as the editorial member for Songkhana Korean Journal of Science and Technology and Kunta University Journal of Science. He is also the guest editor for Frontier in Marine Science and Frontier in 
physiology. He was appointed a uh, visiting professor at the Tianjin Agriculture University, Ocean University of China, and Universitat Alanga, Indonesia. He is also currently the chair of the International Atimi Aquaculture Consortium and the secretary of the Asian Fund. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Yong Yik Sung. Please. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. A very good evening to everyone. And uh, could you hear me well? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me acknowledge and thank the organ organizing committee for inviting me uh, to speak at this uh, conference today. And uh, it is good to see everyone, uh, people that I know uh, in Kasitsat University. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit on uh, um, some of the methods that we develop and some of the fundamentals that we have uh, uh, worked on uh, particularly uh, on the topic of uh, tolerance against disease and tolerance against stress by utilizing um, and monitoring and manipulating uh, heat shock proteins in, in terms of expression, upregulations, and to see what kind of benefits we could get from uh, these heat shock proteins. Well, if you look at the scenario of aquaculture today, I'm very happy to see that uh, um, heat represents one of the uh, treatment methods for disease control in shrimp culture and also in fish culture. And this applies to a lot of uh, big shrimp farms right now as, uh, as we speak, and uh, they are using heat shock as one of the alternative to control uh, disease, especially white spot syndrome disease and also vibrios in their farm. And uh, in this respect, of course, uh, we are also very, very proud that uh, 15 years ago, we discovered that uh, heat shock represents one of the uh, main methods to enhance some of the uh, immuno immunostimulatory uh, uh, response of uh, utilizing uh, brown shrimp artemia as a model organism. And this was done already 15 years ago. And at that time, really, we really do not know what actually uh, happens because there are very uh, limited uh, findings available, especially in the respect of uh, uh, shrimp as a model organism. But what we saw uh, that time was when we give artemia or brine shrimp uh, a, a short-term non-lethal heat shock, which we expose them from uh, 28 degrees Celsius to 37 degrees Celsius for only a short period of time, 30 minutes, and given them uh, a six hours recovery period, it protects them against several species of uh, opportunistic or pathogenic vibrios at those times. And, uh, oh, we observed that uh, in the protein profile, a specific class of uh, proteins has been upregulated, and we saw that uh, it is heat shock protein 70. And um, um, uh, on top of that, we also see a significant reduction on the vibrio colonization of those artemia. What is more important to it is that those artemia were raised exactly and they were raised in notobiotic conditions whereby heat shock is also done in a sterile condition where there is no interference of other pathogenic bacteria in the system. Therefore, uh, the, the, the results that we obtain is quite uh, uh, precise where there is no interference of other pathogens or environment in our system. Um, at that time also, we see that uh, one of my colleagues uh, who, who uh, followed up the, uh, my studies, he observed that uh, enhanced survival is due to the enhance of a prophenol oxidase activity in shrimp. Now, what are heat shock proteins? Heat shock proteins are a class of proteins where uh, it ranges from uh, uh, bacteria to human. Every living cells and organism in this world 
has heat shock proteins in them and they are constitutively expressed in uh, uh, their body or cells and mainly they function as chaperones where they help to repair uh, proteins that are damaged as a result of uh, uh, abiotic or biotic stresses. And of course, um, uh, some of these heat shock proteins also uh, help uh, uh, in the translocation of protein and target proteins for degradation when it is appeared in an endogenous form or intracellular form. And uh, there are a lot of classes of heat shock proteins that has been uh, characterized until today. But of all those heat shock proteins, uh, heat shock proteins in the class of 70 is perhaps uh, one of the most conserved heat shock proteins that are available uh, until today. And in terms of uh, sequence homology, when we uh, compare the sequences of uh, heat shock protein 70 in Artemia and with a lot of other uh, animals or organisms, uh, we see that uh, this is, the sequence similarity is very, very high. And uh, of course, when you have a conserved proteins, probably uh, these conserved proteins would play almost similar roles across these uh, organisms. One of the main function of heat shock proteins is also um, that they play very significant roles in the immune system of uh, whether aquatic organism or in fact uh, uh, terrestrial organisms as well. And uh, once heat shock proteins is uh, uh, um, available outside the cell, they may produce or they may mediate the production of uh, a lot of cell surface peptides and uh, entry antimicrobial substances, just like we see in this uh, mammalian cell models where heat shock proteins serve as with the signaling receptors of the macrophages, they could enhance the production of a wide range of antimicrobial uh, peptides, which suppresses infections. Now, one of the things that uh, we developed 15 years later, which is not very um, long ago, well, is that uh, in order for us to study the real function of heat shock protein 70, of course, we need to uh, exploit available and novel molecular methodologies. And one of the uh, methods that we adopt here in our lab on uh, the uh, investigation of uh, uh, roles of heat shock protein 70 in the Brunstrom Artemia is by using RNAi, but I'm not going to go into very detail of um, the methods and also in the results, but uh, you could always refer to this journal paper uh, for uh, more detail. But uh, briefly, uh, we would like to see uh, when we knock down heat shock protein 70 in those uh, uh, brine shrimp, what would happen in the embryo development, what would happen um, in terms of thermal resistance, and what would happen also uh, uh, on uh, pathogenic vibrio tolerance when uh, heat shock proteins is not present in Artemia. So what we did was uh, we look at the sequence of HSP-70 uh, of uh, Artemia franciscana, and this was accessed used, uh, through the uh, Ghent University uh, genome sequence, which are now being made public uh, recently. So what we did was we construct the plasmid very, very quickly and briefly that uh, we um, that allows the construction of uh, a double-stranded RNA of uh, heat shock protein 70, which uh, we then micro-inject or deliver into the Artemia females uh, through the egg sacs or the brood pouch of the Artemia female. And if you see here that uh, we incorporate those uh, double-stranded RNA with a phenol rate, just to see that those double-stranded RNA were really developed into the body of Artemia and distributed uh, uh, in Artemia as well. And uh, this is very essential because if the double-stranded RNA were not delivered through, through the whole organism, uh, which you turn them, in fact, the Artemia red in color, 
um, you would not be able to successfully uh, knock down heat shock protein 70 in them. So these are the uh, organism, uh, how it looks like. Uh, after injection, we put them in, uh, uh, in petri dishes for uh, um, uh, fertilization. And of course, if you understand the life cycle of Artemia, uh, they go into two modes of reproduction. You have the oviparous reproduction, and then you have the oviviparous reproduction, whereby uh, uh, different condition would induce uh, brine stream either to produce norpli or to produce cysts. So we collect the norpli and cysts, and these are how it looks like after the uh, injection, whereby the mating occurs, and uh, those uh, artemia were put in a small petri dish, and on the uh, below bottom right-hand side, you see that uh, those are the norpli that we collect uh, after um, uh, HSP-70 uh, knockdown. So, of course, one of the very important tools that we have applied, you need to verify them. And uh, we do uh, an R RT, PCR, and also Western blot to see uh, whether Hitchhock's protein 70 is knocked down or not. And if it is knocked down there, after we, we continue our experiments on the thermal tolerance and also bacterial tolerance uh, of those uh, artemia. So, um, well, when we inject, uh, HSP-70 uh, double-stranded RNA into this, the brood uh, sect of the females. And uh, we could see that uh, there is a complete knockdown uh, in cysts, in both cysts and in norpli. And uh, of course, the, the bands that appears there is our control, is a GFP double-stranded RNA. And uh, a, a total uh, knockdown that we could observe here of course, we have to be very, very careful. These are uh, real-time PCR or these are Western blot, but it is undetectable. So when it's undetectable at a, a very low range that you could, could not be observed via our method, I think that uh, we could claim it as a, a, a complete knockdown. So what happens when we completely uh, knock down heat shock protein 70 in Artemia? You see that... Um, uh, they are less, far less uh, tolerance against uh, a, a, a heat shock that otherwise kills them um, in, in a normal condition. So if you look at the blue bars, you have a significant reduction of uh, uh, 30 to 40 percent uh, reduction in terms of survival when you heat them at 38 degrees C. And what is more impressive here is that um, you could see almost a reduction of 30% of uh, um, uh, Vibrio tolerance or survival against a Vibrio uh, Cambelli challenge when you knock down heat shock protein 70 in those Artemia. And uh, this allows us also to look at the transcriptomics analysis, not to go into very detail about the transcriptomic analysis, but then uh, what we uh, observe is that with the transcriptome available, we see that uh, a knockdown of heat shock protein 70 significantly downregulate a lot of important genes and functions in uh, Artemia. And one of the very important things that we discovered here is that apart from the protective and adaptive mechanism, which involves all the uh, immune-related genes that is uh, involved, we also see that HR protein 70 knockdown obscure the chitin synthesis in the cysts as well as the norpli of uh, uh, artemia. And you, if you see uh, on top, uh, the top line of uh, uh, figures, you see that that, that is the control uh, cysts and norpli during the development. Uh, that is with heat shock proteins and the bottom line, you see that even at the cyst stage, the cysts are transparent. And of course, uh, if you know that uh, Artemia cyst is full of uh, chitin and it makes it uh, um, opaque. But then if you look at uh, 
uh, the knockdown cyst, it is completely transparent and you could even see the embryo that is uh, present in the cyst. And while they develop, you could see that all those uh, exoskeleton has been really damaged and uh, some of them even uh, going into deformity. Now, what this means is that it obstructs the chitin biosynthesis pathway of uh, uh, artemia and I could speculate uh, uh, right easily that, uh, in fact, when the chitin is not present or the uh, shells has been damaged, of course, it is very, very easy for pathogenic bacteria to colonize and to enter and to infect them. So apart from uh, downregulation of several uh, immune genes as well. So from here, this case study of uh, Artemia, we um, could see that heat shock protein 70 is really, really important in the tolerance of uh, uh, heat as well as uh, pathogenic vibrio uh, challenge. So it is indeed required for protection against uh, uh, pathogens. So I would like to move forward also to um, um, this very interesting paper from a colleague, uh, Prof. Anchali uh, from Chulalongkong University. And uh, she published a very nice uh, work with uh, Wisarut. And they have shown that uh, um, these heat shock protein 70 and 90 are involved in shrimp. Uh, uh, P. vaname against uh, 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 Vibrio challenge. And this also has been uh, something to do with non-lethal heat shock where they impose uh, or carry out a non-lethal heat shock and the shrimps are protected against uh, Vibrios. So at the same time of what they have been uh, running these experiments uh, in 2017 and get it published in 2017, we also did non-lethal heat shock and heat shock protein studies, but we didn't go into uh, um, the, a bio, the, the biotic challenge, which is the, the, the Vibrio challenge. At that time, we were uh, looking at whether non-lethal heat shock would induce heat shock protein 70 synthesis or not in the shrimp, and uh, whether they are protected against heat or other abi abiotic stresses like ammonia or uh, heavy metals in shrimp. But the paper from uh, Prof. Anchali's group has really gave us a good kick for us to start off with by looking whether heat shock proteins also play a role as such it plays in uh, the brine shrimp artemia. So we try to knock down now heat shock protein 70 in penis vaname. And of course, we work with very small uh, post larvae because if you look at the big shrimps, sometimes uh, it is a bit difficult for us to completely uh, knock down heat shock protein 70 in them or very difficult for the double-stranded RNA to uh, really travel across the whole body of Vaname. So what we did was we used back the same uh, methods which we apply in Artemia and we deliver those, uh, uh, sorry, we de deliver those uh, double-stranded RNA uh, into the body of uh, uh, shrimp post larvae, and uh, we try to uh, optimize those uh, knockdown procedures by injecting different concentration of uh, uh, double-stranded RNA in those uh, uh, larvae, and uh, we determine how much of uh, uh, those uh, double-stranded RNA could knock down uh, the HSP-70 content in these uh, pin vaname uh, larvae. So what we saw, and we designed uh, two double-stranded RNA to knock down the heat shock cognate and the heat shock proteins of the 70 uh, kilodeltons, and the maximum uh, protocol that we could uh, get until today is only by knocking down almost 73% of uh, heat shock proteins in uh, those shrimp. But we could not at the moment knock off or completely take away all the expression of heat shock proteins in the shrimp. But nevertheless, we also see that uh, when you reduce the 
amount or the content of heat shock proteins in shrimp larvae, you could also see that there is a significant reduction of the tolerance against Vibrio parahemolyticus. So these uh, studies are being done right now. And of course, uh, we do um, speculate together with the group of uh, uh, Prof. Anchali whether is there any possible mechanistic action of heat shock protein 70 in the prophenol oxidase uh, activation pathway. And this, in fact, was already been published uh, uh, by the group in uh, Chula Longkorn University. Very nice work from that group as well. So um, what we have published, uh, uh, apart from the uh, uh, benefits in uh, Vibrio tolerance, uh, we know very well that uh, uh, Peneus vaname, if you knock down heat shock protein 70, they are uh, also very uh, low in resistance in terms of pH and salinity stress, and those are uh, abiotic stresses. So um, a bit of a take-home message that uh, I'd like to give you here is that in both shrimp species, Artemia and also uh, vaname, uh, heat shock proteins play a very significant roles in the abiotic and as well as biotic, particularly vibrio tolerance in uh, uh, Artemia and Vaname. And uh, to our interests, it is very interesting for us to see whether certain manipulation of the upregulation of uh, endogenous heat shock protein expression can boost tolerance of shrimp against uh, abiotic and bi biotic stress or not. So, uh, in fact, we have uh, uh, started to look at what we call uh, heat shock protein 70 stimulating factor, which we uh, could isolate from uh, plants, uh, coastal plants, uh, that is uh, stress tolerance. And of course, they would, I think, uh, possess uh, a lot of... Um, um, factors which could enhance heat shock proteins uh, in organism. And uh, we tested one very simple plant and uh, it is uh, called Pandanus tectorius. Uh, what we did is that we extract the fruit and leaf of those uh, 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 plants and we um, run them and see whether it enhances or not uh, the expression of heat shock protein 70 in uh, shrimp. And we also see whether they are better tolerant against uh, vibrios and whether there are effect or not in the immune gene expression, as well as uh, what would happen in uh, the, 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 the appearance of those uh, hepatopranchus tissues and also uh, um, how um, severe the infections are when they are exposed to uh, a pathogenic vibrio challenge. I'm not going to go into the very detail of this because of the time limitation, but if you are interested, please uh, go through this um, um, publication, which we have already published uh, uh, in uh, uh, journals. And uh, apart from that, uh, I'd like to end uh, my presentation today uh, with uh, also certain reference that uh, we have published previously, uh, the use of heat shock proteins, the roles of heat shock proteins uh, in disease control in aquatic organism, which is particularly useful in uh, the aquaculture industry. So with this, I'd like to thank uh, the floor. And of course, uh, this uh, project wouldn't be uh, possible without the funding from the Ministry of uh, Education, Higher Education, Ministry of Science. Um, some of some part of our work were also uh, sponsored or granted uh, by the government of uh, China through certain grant awards given to me. Um, cannot uh, forget uh, the two person or the three person who gave me the idea of uh, looking at heat shock proteins in aquatic organism, uh, Professor Peter Bozier, uh, Professor Patrick Sogolos, and also the late Professor Thomas McRae. Um, um, many thanks also to all my uh, graduate students uh, and postgraduates uh, who have assisted in uh, these studies. 
Thank you very much. And I pass it back to the floor. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much for your impressive presentation. Today you talk about uh, how to apply the heat shock protein to for the prevention and improve the tolerance of trim or an atemia to the stress and repeal infection. You speak, uh, you mentioned that uh, heat shock protein stimulation not only improve the stress tolerance, but the repeal and the immune system is also enhanced. And uh, in, in addition, when we knock down the gene of the heat shock protein, it also reduces the survival of the atemia when suffer to the stress and viral infection. Okay, I have one small question to ask you. Uh, according to your presentation, you say if we use the non lethal heat, we can induce the heat shock protein expression and enhance the survival rate of the trim and atemia. And other than non lethal heat and also the plant extract, do you have uh, any other method to improve or enhance the activity of heat shock protein to improve the trim survival against the disease or the stress? Yep, thank you very much for the question. In fact, uh, when I mentioned just now, non lethal heat shock represents one of the most common and most effective way to induce heat shock protein expression in aquatic organism. So the here that uh, here we presented only on shrimp, but then uh, we also uh, run uh, those exper experiments in fish and other organisms like bivalves as well. And we do publish all those uh, results in journals. Well, uh, uh, I would think that non-lethal heat shock is the best right now to enhance heat shock proteins because it is direct and that is why it is called heat shock proteins because you induce them by heat shock and of course uh, other than heat shock many other stresses can also induce heat shock proteins in aquatic organism and you, if you expose them to any kind of stresses they can induce heat shock protein uh, 70. the issue here is that if you use a different method to induce heat shock proteins in them, how effective they are in upregulating heat shock protein expression to an optimal level, we say, right? So, and the second thing is that the protocol that you use to heat shock shrimp might be very different with the protocol that you heat shock fish or bivalve. At the same time, we monitored the, the level of heat shock protein content in those organisms like shrimp, if you have one time non lethal heat shock, it stays there for maybe three to seven days, depending on the species. If you have bivalve, we see that upregulation of heat shock proteins by one time non lethal heat shock would stay for a month or even more. And this was the observation that we see. And of course, uh, uh, it depends from uh, species to species. So there is no standard protocol of whether uh, non lethal heat shock is better or other stresses are better. But uh, we know at the moment that heat shock and also other stresses induce the endogenous expression of heat shock proteins in aquatic organisms and it stays there prolong the duration and that depends a lot on the species that we uh, induce okay thank you very much for your very clear answer so it depends on the species and depend on the the dose and duration of the treatment yeah yeah okay thank you very much dr young so so we can move to the next speaker the last one Yes, um, our last um, speaker is from Ocean University of China, Professor Liu Yang. He is currently assistant dean of College of Fisheries, Ocean University of China, uh, deputy director of uh, Haishao Bay Fisheries Ecosystem Field Scientific observation and research station ministry of education and member of resource 
and Environment Branch of Chinese Fisheries Society. His research mainly engaged in the course research of remote sensing and GIS technology in marine resources and environment, aquaculture zone, zoning, management, uh, fishery resources, uh, utilization and development. He has published more than 80 SCI papers in top international journals such as Global Change by Ecology, ICS Journal of Marine Science, Marine Policy and Aquaculture as the first or corresponding order. He is an associate editor of Frontiers in Marine Science and an editorial board member of Remote Sensing and Fishes. Everyone, please welcome um, Professor Liu Yang. Okay, thank you for your introduction. I will share my screen. Okay, can you can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Ah, okay. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you for invitation and uh, give me this opportunity to see all of my old friends. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to see all of you. And uh, today I will uh, introduce my topic is about the satellite and the fishery. So today, uh, this is uh, uh, three parts. So firstly, I would like to introduce the challenge and the prospects of marine fisheries resource under multi pressures. <clears throat> so we know the state of the world uh, fisheries and agriculture. So the key rule of the fish is uh, global food and the nutrient security. So it's very important. So we know the uh, global capture of fisheries is increased from uh, 1990 to 2018 about by 40 uh, percent but for the agriculture is increased by the 527 percent and also for the food fish consumption also increased 122 percent so uh, that's very important. But now, uh, they, uh, the fisheries focus uh, many, many uh, scientific issues. So such as the uh, st structure and the function of the ecosystem, and also the biodiversity reduction and the decline of fisheries resources. Uh, under the ecological disaster, such as the red tail, green algae, or, or, uh, and the jellyfish. And also for the environment, uh, there also has the climate change and the IRC interaction, and also the changes in marine environment. So under multi-pressure, the, ma the marine fisheries resource uh, are in an uh, overdeveloped state. So after 2000, the global fisheries resources are almost completely exploited and uh, overfished. So the sustainable ut utilization of the fisheries resource is very important and the great challenges. So the second 
uh, the rule of the remote sensing in climate change in ecosystem and the fisheries. So how could we use the remote sensing? We know the satellite. Oh, Professor Li Yang, okay. um, sorry to interrupt you. Can you move the slide with your talk, please? Because now we only have the first slide on the screen. Oh, sorry. sorry, so... Uh... So you can not see my slide move? No, 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 it's okay now. It's okay. Now it's okay. Yeah. Oh, no, okay. it's okay. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry for that. So this is the state uh, and also the uh, scientific issues. So I will begin from the second part. So the rule of the remote sensing. So we know the satellite remote sensing uh, it is the link between physical oceanography, phytoplankton, and the fish. So satellite technology is only the two could provide the global and uh, small scale uh, primary productivities. So it is a uh, very important tool, such as the ocean color satellite. So maybe many students uh, use the, uh, this data from the NASA. Uh, NASA. This is the Sea Waves satellite. Uh, it could give us the ocean color, so we can uh, calculate the geography and the other uh, parameters. And also from the satellite, we can calculate the uh, preliminary production. So this is very important for fisheries, as, such as this image. This is seasonal image, winter, spring, summer, and fall. So we can see the distribution of the preliminary production in the world. So the red part is the high production region. So the red part region also the uh, means this is uh, this is the high fishing ground. So uh, we can see in the world in the world uh, there has some part of the high fishing ground, and the blue part means the low uh, primary production. Uh, the blue part is no fish. And also we can use the satellite data to calculate uh, the size of the uh, pro uh, production, primary production. So this is, uh, we can understand the relationship between the uh, phytoplankton size and the climate change. And also for the uh, global carbon cycle, uh, this is an uh, important tool. We know the photosynthesis consumes carbon dioxide gas, uh, so by the, uh, from the particulate carbon of the algae, and also the uh, respiration by the, all organism produce the carbon dioxide gas. So the temperature rise, such as the global warming, will seriously affect the balance. So that's very important uh, scientific issue. And also, uh, satellite can calculate the carbon dioxide estimate. estimate. So we can uh, see this is the satellite image. Uh, for the ocean ice, uh, so this is the big challenge now for, the, uh, for our Earth. So we can know, due to the global warming, uh, the Arctic is estimated to be largely ice-free in summer by 2035. So now, uh, this year also uh, already ice-free in summer. Uh, so uh, we know the global change is very serious now. 
So by satellite, we can calculate the sea ice, and also we can calculate the primary production. So we can see the relationship between the sea ice and the uh, primary production. This is very important for the ecosystem. And also the sea level rise is very important for the agriculture. So almost uh, most of the our agriculture and the people living in the near coast region. So if the sea level rise about one meter, so there will be uh, tens of millions of people die and the tens of trillions of dollars is uh, damaged. So this is a very uh, serious factor. Okay, I will, uh, so the third part, uh, I will introduce some case study, uh, for example, how to application of remote sensing in fisheries and agriculture. Uh, for example, uh, we use the application uh, remote sensing in near shore agricultural system. And for this species, Japanese kelp, uh, so we use the satellite data, uh, for example, the SST sea surface temperature, uh, KLF A, and uh, suspended sediment and the basimetry. And uh, we build the suitable agricultural site selection model uh, for these two regions as an example. So also we uh, use the satellite to calculate the sea ice. So we uh, studied on the influence of sea ice on the culture of the scalp. So this is the Hokkaido uh, in the north, north part uh, of the Japan. So in the winter, uh, there has a uh, uh, four months ice cover seasons. Also the uh, culture uh, grows under the ice. So we use the satellite to uh, calculate. This is very uh, useful too. And also for the uh, China, uh, this is Shandong province. Uh, now I'm in Qingdao city, now uh, in here. So near the Shandong uh, coast, uh, this is the popular agricultural species, uh, species is the oyster. So we also use this uh, model to calculate the oyster culture uh, best region, uh, also combined with the DB model. And another case is the cooperation with the, uh, my friends, uh, Dr. Man. So we together uh, advise uh, uh, a student to study the green muscle in Gulf of the Thailand. So this is also important species in Thailand, uh, green muscle. So we know the production is varies every year. So we use the, uh, this satellite model uh, to build the sustainable score. So we can see the, this part is very suitable. Uh, blue, blue part is very suitable. And the red part is not, uh, is very worse. So we can see uh, every year is different, the blue part. So the reason we can uh, we calculate from the river and the, the monsoon. So we found out find out some uh, impact uh, factors. Also, uh, recently the very hot uh, the popular word is the heat waves. So uh, in this year we can see uh, the heat heat waves in Canada. We know that Canada is a very cold region, but uh, the temperature is more than uh, 45 uh, in June 29. So all the uh, 
mussels uh, mussels were cooked uh, on the coast so this is this is a big uh, issue another is we applied the remote sensing to the ocean fisheries so one of the satellite data is the night light so because the fisheries uh, also in the midnight uh, to check the fish by light during the night so uh, we can use the satellite to uh, observe uh, to monitoring uh, the light in the night in the ocean so we uh, build a comprehensive system of the multi-source satellite uh, to monitoring and assessment the fishery resource in the northwest pacific so during this region uh, there are three main uh, fisheries the macro uh, pacific salary and the screed so we can uh, use this method to monitoring and calculate the fishing number and uh, for the management uh, we also uh, make uh, make a case study in the uh, south part of the uh, china sea so we use the uh, satellite night light uh, to uh, to monitoring and the management this region for for some advice and also uh, for the communication satellite we can build uh, the uh, night working platform uh, to monitoring the fishing uh, uh, region so this is very interesting another uh, part is the for the fisheries prediction this is uh, uh, very popular so generally the process of the fisher fisheries forecast uh, is using uh, many layers of the satellite data such as the eke uh, ssh klfa and sst for so on so and uh, build the model and to make the fo uh, forecast result and uh, for the uh, ocean color so we know the primary production uh, such as the uh, calorie A is very important for the is an important indicator for the uh, fishing ground so we improved uh, three uh, main uh, satellite to make a more accurate ocean color products And also for the Pacific story, uh, this features, uh, we use the satellite data to build the, uh, the normal spawning ground index. So we know the Pacific story is spawning in here. So Kuro Shingo uh, region in the south part of the Japan. So we calculate this region by satellite. And also we uh, forecast the habit distributed model for Pacific salary and uh, for Japanese flying squid for this species we also uh, using uh, satellite data to calculate the spawning ground uh, so this is uh, also important for this species and uh, for the uh, Japanese anchovy uh, this is very popular in Chinese seas uh, so we also uh, access the wintering ground of this species this is the fishing uh, wintering ground prediction map and uh, for the Japanese Sp Spanish macro uh, this species is also very important uh, it's a main fishes, fisheries in China so this is the fishing ground prediction uh, result another species is the small yellow cockle 
uh, this is also important in this region uh, between China and Korea. So we also uh, predict the fishing ground for this species. Okay, I introduced many uh, cases. Uh, finally, I will uh, thank my friends and uh, uh, Thailand and all of my uh, friends and students. So give me my very good memories uh, in 2019. So I wish to can uh, visit uh, Thailand this year and uh, continue our cooperation. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much for Professor Liu Yang for your excellent presentation. So you you provide many examples of how to apply the satellite technology for monitoring the environmental factors that have an application in the fishery and aquaculture, such as estimate the primary production, the carbon dioxide production, and even sea level rise. And so this time to uh, have a Question if anyone in the floor or in online, if you have question, please feel free to ask. Any question? Or may I have some question to ask you, Professor? Uh, okay. May I know that can we use the satellite technology for monitoring the sea pollution such as the garbage or uh, many microplastic because I am not in this field I, I don't know much about the satellite technology but I think it's interesting yeah sure uh, for the pollution and the, especially for the plastic is also very important application of the satellite so uh, that, that's a very interesting uh, when you found the, the plastic issue is the the problem is get better or get worse in now today. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> sorry because I didn't focus on the plastic. Oh. So may, may, maybe very serious now. Uh, yeah. And may I have another question? I would like to know about the uh, uh you you say you monitor the aquaculture activity by satellite. How can we use the? How can we obtain the data from the aquaculture by use, using the satellite technology? So, you, so you uh, need, how mm -mm. can we get the satellite data? Uh, my question is: I'm sorry, maybe my I'm confused. You <laughs> is because when you see the map from the satellite, it show the red color, the blue color, the yellow color, but I don't know uh, what is color related to the aquaculture activity or it related to the nutrient uh, or it related okay. to some factor. Okay, okay. The, uh, uh, the color is uh, produced by computer. So mm. the original satellite data is not color, it's for the some digital numbers. So we just, we, we just produced the satellite data uh, to the image just uh, people like to see the true color image uh, yeah. so that so uh, the okay. color is not uh, not satellite data yes, <laughs> but the, the, the color is based on the the nutrient the or the amount of the feed or or what, what factors yes best for our understanding <laughs> yes oh. okay Any question? Okay, okay, please. Hi, hi, hello. Uh, this is Men, Dr. Yang Liu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you, you present a lot of interesting application using the satellite remote sensing for fisheries. But those applications that you show mostly, except the one that we did together in Siracha, uh, what, what do you think about the future application more on the tropical area what is the is it can be done or what what is going to be the most difficult part to apply the technique you apply in the those high latitude area to the tropical area 
Uh, thank you. Very good question. So the tropical region is very high uh, fisheries activity region. So in the tropical sea, there has a lot of fi fishing boats and a lot of uh, agricultural sites. So for the remote sensing, there has a lot of topic <laughs> to, to study. So we can, we can together to study a lot of things in tropical region. Just, just more, how about the, yeah, a lot of opportunity, Professor, but what do you think about the most difficulty? What, what can be the most difficult part applying your research in the tropical area? Thank you. Uh, most uh, difficult thing is the site survey. So, because satellite only can see from the uh, sky, but the actually ground uh, situation we don't know. So we should uh, to make a lot of survey. Okay. <laughs> Any more question? We can have time for one last question. No more, no more question. So then uh, we move to the session uh, for the panel discussion. Uh, that um, you can see that today, uh, our speakers have given us knowledge about the use of, of science, fisheries science, also, also science and technology, uh, such as uh, satellite remote sensing, heat shock protein, um, living uh, uh, microorganism, as well as increasing the value of fish waste, uh, which could offer solutions achieving carbon neutrality and sustainable development leading to a higher well-being. As everyone knows that sustainability and well-being are two key um, global policy priority. So uh, may we have uh, your opinion and research to the real application based on the readiness or status of Thailand, please. Shall we start with... Um, Professor Hirono, please. Is it the question very clear to you? We would like to have your opinion. How can, I mean, uh, the ongoing research can be applied uh, to a uh, real application uh, based on the readiness uh, or status of Thailand? Dr. Wan Wimon, please. So today I just uh, introduce you a part of my research. But on this research, it's, it's not easy to apply for uh, aquaculture, uh, not only Thailand, but also other uh, areas. So we also need uh, education. And education is not only for the student. Uh, fish and shrimp farmer also uh, should have uh, education from the expert uh, of the university or uh, uh, department of fisheries like this. So uh, for sustainable aquaculture, we have to work together with the uh, university person, uh, they conduct a research and uh, expert of the Department of Fisheries, Minister of Agriculture. They will link between the university expert and the fish and the shrimp farmers. We work together. Then we can uh, continue uh, sustainable aquaculture and combating uh, infectious disease in aquaculture. Uh, this is my uh, opinions uh, for our future uh, development of aquaculture industry.
Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. Um. On my opinion, uh, I think the applications of the research um to to be used or to be applied for the private sector or to be commercialized in the market, especially in the field of visualization, to become a the functional ingredient or healthy food, actually is a big concern for a long time for almost a uh, researcher. And also for the funding agency, when they give us the, the funding to do uh, some research, they expect that, that the research should be leased to the end user. It's not just publication and that's it, right? And I heard um, the comment from a speaker in the morning session that she worked at the past of the private sector. And she, she mentioned that, uh, she commented that, okay, um, teacher, professor, researcher, many researchers in university um, have published a lot of research, both in uh, national level, international level. Uh, so the pinpoint is how, how to apply, how to apply that research the user so so she, she mentioned for us that please uh please try to make it possible that we agree because in the field of uh, waste utilization we have many many good publications from many university in thailand from department of fishery products from print of Songkla a lot and many university have done very good job on the research uh, but some can be applied and some still just on the paper. So, so I think in my opinion that I work with the private sector, we should talk, we should talk before we starting any experiment. It's like um, uh, so far we have done with um, one company, start talking, what do you want? Mm. And what the things that you want, just let us know. And uh, she mentioned, okay, um, professor, you just do like this, like this, the functional ingredient. Uh, we should not have much chemical to extract. Mm -hmm. um, the method should be possible to be large scale. And the important thing, it should be the low cost. The cost is quite important for them also. It's like, uh, I, I think we need to talk before mm. we are ahead to do any experiment. Okay, we can do the, the deep thing for publication, but the possible thing, the feasible thing that provide for the industry, we, we can think about that is mm. like a parallel. Yeah. So so talking, discuss, and uh, before starting any anything is very important. And during the experiment, we can also uh, give them some idea to adjust our research also. So so I think this is the, the one way that, that possible. I, I, I think we have many, many technology, mm -hmm. but it's stuck oh how to apply, right. how to <laughs> do like a big scale mm -hmm. because when we do like a large scale, the property okay like this, but it changed when we do is larger scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, talking and discussions uh, maybe can can help. Yeah, we, we, we do agree with you that uh, uh, maybe the best strategy is just like start from the end user, right? And uh, I mean, even at a really low, a really small scale or at the large scale, scale it would be uh, more effective if it just start from the end user. I think maybe Dr. Pramono, uh, you can join. Um, I mean, do you have any idea about this? Have you hear what we are talking about? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, previously, because the connection uh, cut it, and then I cannot talk, talk about my slide. However, from the discussion today, I think you bet. I, I think mean, that the main point is to make a bridge. Yeah, yes. To, to make you... a bridge between academic, government, and also uh, uh, 
on uh, you know like business. Could you hear me? Yes, but uh, the connection is not very stable. I think you no, you better no. turn you turn off your camera. And is it okay to? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, please continue. Right now, it is clear. It is clear right now. Yeah, better. Uh, okay. Thank you. Let, okay. So what what I think uh, from the discussion today is uh, how to make a bridge between. <laughs> Is this still not clear? Sorry. <laughs> so, so the most important thing is to make a bridge between the academic, business, and government to support how what we already have in the laboratory into can be accepted by the people in the commerce. So this bridge is, of course, not only short term, but also need to be continued in the future. And also, what uh, what we need to think is, I agree with Sensei that mentioned, we need to educate the people. For example, like, if we develop products from the seafood waste, yeah, um, if the if the uh, common people the the consumer think that it is not appropriate to eat uh, waste, actually not waste, they already not as a people. So we need to have three components of the, the, the peoples from academic, business, and government to develop long-term collaboration. That's my idea. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry about the, I mean, uh, the, the connection is not very stable. Um, yeah, let's move to uh, Professor Yong Yik Sung, please. Yeah, uh, I'm going to give a bit of the comments of the, uh, uh, or, uh, and a bit of suggestions here. I think one of the, the difficulties of uh, transferring from lab to business is, of course, uh, the reliability of uh, the technologies that we develop. And uh, I think one of the most important thing is uh, the readiness of the product, which has to be, uh, sub I mean, has to be confirmed a lot with a lot of good fundamental studies in the lab prior to uh, bringing them into uh, the market. So um, I think one should not uh, rush this uh, very quickly of bringing what is in the lab to the business without having a thorough look at the fundamentals of uh, uh, research that has been done. Um, but a lot of uh, companies right now, um, they need to have new products coming out very quickly. And that is why sometimes uh, products that is developed has not been uh, really uh, studied uh, thoroughly, I would say. And uh, of course, the, the results that we obtain in the lab might not be similar that uh, will be produced in the field conditions because field conditions such as in the field of uh, aquaculture in pond condition, it is massive and um, results from the lab sometimes would not be reproducible uh, in the in the field trial. Therefore, it is highly essential for us to um, do a very thorough testing first uh, in the lab, in the field, prior to uh, commercialization of the product. And uh, talking about the, the readiness in Thailand and uh, the technologies that we develop, we have seen uh, that uh, in big shrimp farms right now, in the first uh, of my slides, that people are doing heat shocks already to uh, 
protect shrimps against diseases. So this is good news for us because, like I said, 15 years ago, we hit shock artemia, we hit shock shrimp. Uh, we only see that the protection is there. But then today we see that uh, more and more shrimp farms has been using heat shock to control disease. So right. these are a very important uh, contribution to the industry. And of course, whether um, Thailand is ready to adopt the strategies that we use, uh, one of the uh, suggestions that uh, uh, I propose at the end of my study is to look at uh, heat shock protein stimulating factor from plants to enhance heat shock proteins in shrimp or in fish. And this might be done uh, collectively with all the collaborators uh, in the world, not only Vietnam, but many uh, scientists, scientists could screen uh, bioactive compounds or whatever uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, good uh, compounds that is in uh, herbs or plants that could be applied uh, for heat shock protein induction in aquatic organisms, particularly for use in aquaculture. That's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it seemed to be very practical if you just use the plant, right? The plant, yeah, yeah. yeah. as plant a source. Or compounds, yes. Mm. Can you give us an example of that plant? Well, I, I have already uh, shown in my last, night, uh, last slide that uh, a, a, a tropical plant uh, by the name of Pandanus uh, tectorius, uh, which is just a coastal plant that you find. And of course, I, I am very sure that not only this plant uh, consists of uh, heat shock protein stimulating uh -huh. factor, uh -huh. but a uh -huh. lot of uh, plants that uh, is uh, available at... Uh, high stress conditions and one of the um, uh, plants that has been discovered uh, is um, a, a cactus plant cactus um, yeah mm -hmm. it's a cactus plant that uh, they uh, isolate uh, uh, compounds from uh, opuntia if i'm not mistaken that uh, this uh, cactus plant consists a lot of uh, heat shock protein stimulating factor, and they have already turned that uh, into uh, applications in aquaculture. So now it is a product. And uh, also I have seen uh, one of the product that has already been established uh, by Inve, which is a, a relatively a, a big aquaculture product company, that one of the product uh, were also using this technology of uh, heat shock protein stimulating factor. So slowly, this has been uh, uh, applied in aquaculture, which the technology has been developed 15 years ago. But of course, there are still more, uh, a lot more potential. Yeah, it's coming. Mm -hmm. They are discovered yeah. in the in the future for everyone. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um. And uh, we move to Professor Liu. Uh, that, that is a uh, uh, request from the floor that uh, they would like the speaker to turn on the the camera so they know that who who are you and uh, can um, yes to me even though I'm not in your field it is obvious that uh, you can use uh, remote sensing right uh, technology to um, help improve the the um, fisheries, uh, I mean, to define, or you can, you, you also already uh, given the example of that and even have the, uh, the work together with um, Dr. Dr. Tanaj Pong, Professor Tanaj Pong, right? And uh, can, can you just, um, uh, because in, because I'm, I'm not in, the, in your field, can I just ask a simple question that how can you share the information from satellite in case that you use with the others, like from different country, like you mentioned about US, Canada, and also the other country. I'm not sure that you understand my question. Uh... Is this Yes, I, I try to answer. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, yes, please. So, for, firstly, uh, 
now for our study, mostly, most, uh, mostly uh, satellite data is free for uh, we, we can get. I, I see. All oh, right. US, okay. US and Canada and Europe, Japan, China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, so free for the study. Mm -hmm. It is no problem. And ah. the, uh, so the, the challenge is the, to understand the uh, local situation is the challenge. So uh, easily say, say we can get uh, data is no problem, but uh, we cannot know the situation for the local uh, issue. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, so we, we can uh, cooperate with uh, every local people and the local fishermen and the local agricultural uh, management uh, to study. Uh, mm. That means that you don't need to ask any permission from anyone, right? It's just like um, uh, you don't need to ask permission? Uh, yeah, yes, the, because the data uh, is free. Really Ah, I see. Yeah, yes. all right. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, Dr. Tirawa, do you have any thing that would like to share um, for this question, or we can just move to the next question? Yeah, uh, all, all right. Thank you very much for the first question. So the next question is, um, what, are, uh, what are the future trends that uh, can, I mean, in your field, in your ongoing research? that um, you can please share with us. Let's first start with Professor here or not, please. The future trend of the ongoing research that you have just talked about. Okay, so it, it, the, the question is very difficult for me. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I'm developing the prevention method against the infectious disease in the aquaculture. So I, I, I'm already collaborating with the private sectors. And also I collaborating with that uh, researcher in Thailand. So maybe uh, in near future, I will try to use our product in a shrimp farm and a fish farm in Thailand. Yeah, because yes. I think that is very interesting, even though you mentioned that it is not like vaccine mm. or the other tools, right? Yes. But it seems to be sustainable uh, tools. I mean, yes, and it can be like uh, so natural to use living organism, microorganism in the pond, right? Yeah, and uh, so, uh, as I told you, I have a collaboration with the Thai researchers. So uh, I often uh, visit a uh, fish farm and the shrimp farm, and then I talk with the farmers, what is the problems, what they want to do. So this is also very important for me uh, to do something research for my future. And, uh, and uh, I have one question. Uh, do you have a society of fishery science or a society of aquaculture in Thailand? In Japan, we have. Do you have? We, do, you, do we have? Maybe, maybe um, yeah. we, we do have aquaculture society in Thailand, but uh -huh. mostly it's from uh, based on the species of an animal. For example, the Thai Trim Association. Uh -huh. Thai yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have. And tuna, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, it, it, uh, tuna is not in Japan, uh, uh, there is a society of fishery science. This is a quite big society. And the members from the university, uh, private sector, government sector, and the local government sectors. Uh -huh. And uh, we have uh, two uh, conferences. In the spring uh, conference and the autumn conference. At that conference, uh, more than 1,000 people attend. Oh. Uh, not only the university, but also the private sector. So the uh, university or local government researchers uh, give uh, papers, talk uh, uh, papers, and, uh, so, and then we communicate with the private sector's people. 
Yeah, so, so such a so societies and the conference are very good for making a bridge between the private and academic, and also the a student uh, attend such a conference. So student will have a new experience, and also the student uh, will have a chance to talk with a private uh, sectors researchers or companies people. So uh, th this is my uh, comment and the suggestion. So in uh, Thailand, uh, in my understanding, as I told you, the, uh, each species, uh, they have a society, but not the whole. Oh, yes, 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 we yeah. also do have, but maybe not like a thousand people like Japan. People <laughs> have a much smaller yeah, scale. Maybe, yeah. But we do That's a small also, group. Yes, yeah, small group, but it also uh, include the government sector, and from the university, the farmer and uh, private sector. Mm -hmm. Okay, we do it. We had to have conference also every year. Uh, okay. Sorry, can I interrupt as an audience? It's quite surprised me. I'm not in the uh, aquaculture industry. I'm a physical oceanographer, but Japan, they have a lot of, you know, I mean, the fishery activity and aquaculture. But as compared to Thailand, our number is much more. Maybe that's why you conduct your research also in Thailand to compete with the tropical disease and others. But why we cannot gather? Why Thai, Thai society cannot gather? What is the secret? First, I ask the Thai, uh, I mean, the expertise, why we cannot gather that much, pe much, that much people? And ask uh, Professor Hiro, is the secret how can you get together so strong and uh, you create a very strong society because that is yeah, a, maybe, the, yeah. the big gap of Thai. We can learn from that. Yes, yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, at the conference, uh, the most of the uh, professors or researchers in the university would give a talk what they are doing and what they. Uh, Conducting, so the private sector the people can learn. And as I told you, uh, fishery science, uh, many of the people are uh, doing many many different things. But uh, they make together and then give a talk. So sometimes uh, there are several different uh, rooms. One room is the fish disease. One room are uh, fishing or food science. But uh, sometimes uh, we attend uh, different rooms different rooms, uh, not my research areas, but yeah. uh, I can learn something about mm. this. So, so this is, I think, very important mm. to have a new knowledge, mm. new experience from the different research areas. That, that, that and the private uh, people, uh, private sector people also sometimes give a talk yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, exchange some information. Of course, uh, the private sector's people have some secret. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but uh, most of the private sector's researchers, uh, they share their research and what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe um, associate professor Wan Chai also can share with, I mean, uh, in this uh, topic. Or the Dr. Wan Chai, uh, can you please? Because he is also working in the private sector for a long, long time. Thank you. Uh, maybe I think it depends on uh, business and uh, uh, atmosphere uh, during the meeting, I think. But we, we can generate the, the good atmosphere if we try. Because uh, we mm. have some example for like a food scientist has a very very big conference in mm. Thailand yeah, mm. that can they can gathering together. Uh -huh. And uh, I mean, uh, who gonna initiate the meeting <laughs> or environment that you just mentioned about? Uh -huh. What do you think? Uh, we we should do we? something. Yeah, you mean? Uh, but we are in fishery. Yeah. Academy? And, yeah, academy should be, yeah. Okay. And we, we have to connect with the private sector and many 
also government officer also who dealing with the fishery yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. every stakeholder should join together and we may have some discussion mm. and set up some something yeah mm. Mm. yeah yeah, I think the faculty of history is Kasesato University. I think this uh, only you can do. Only oh, really? Yes, in the beginning. So you start and then so uh, you invite other universities uh, because in our government sectors, uh, there are many of the alumni from the faculty of history is Kasesato University. Mm -hmm. And also uh, in the private sectors. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It seemed to be a um, very constructive presentation. <laughs> in, in my opinion, yeah, I think opinion. Uh, the, the most uh, limitation is about the, the budget. Because as I know, the, uh, mm -hmm. the conference related to aquaculture society is mostly sponsored by private sector, uh -huh. not by government. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the economy of that year. If the economy mm -hmm. is good, such as a uh, few years ago when Thai stream production is very high in, in very good production. So we have a big conference, the bigger. But today we have smaller because uh -huh. I think many company, they have uh, reduced in their profit. Uh -huh. their, their profit is get lost because of the disease and the economy. So it may be one cause of the why Thai society cannot uh, held a big conference like Japan. Ah, I see. Yeah, that, that's a very, yeah. very good opinion. And um, can we have, we, we still have uh, two minutes. Yep. So, Professor Yong, do you want to share with us for the future trend? Yeah, I think for the future trend of uh, the research, I think uh, a lot of fundamental work still needs to be done in the field of my uh, studies and uh, particularly how um, uh, it is applied in aquaculture. But uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, more and more publications uh, are coming out since 2017, since we published our work today. You can see that, uh, in fact, every week and month that the uh, people are publishing in the topic of heat shock proteins in aquatic organism, whether to uh, uh, study the fundamental aspect and roles of heat shock proteins or uh, uh, it is uh, or its uh, application in uh, environmental managements because uh, heat shock proteins is also one of the uh, biomarker of stress for environmental stresses. So uh, again, I see a very good trend of uh, increasing research in this topic, and I hope that it keeps increasing uh, <laughs> in the years to come. And uh, particularly those, uh, I wish also if more and more uh, scientists could uh, uh, study uh, the roles of this protein in the immune enhancement and also the immune response in aquatic organism that would really give us uh, a good um, boost to the application in aquaculture. Mm, all mm. right. Thank you for your opinion and um, also that uh, opinion from uh, Professor Hirono that seemed to be a constructive note on which to bring this panel to an end. Thank you very much for today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm fly when you enjoy. <laughs> so I, I believe three hour flies. And uh, thank you very much uh, for the presenter uh, on site and online. You make our three hour flies, <laughs> time flies. Okay, uh, to end, uh, may I invite Associate Professor Dr. Wan Chai Watana Metikun, our Associate Dean for Research, to give uh, uh, the token of appreciation to all of the uh, presenter and uh, moderator. Uh, all right, uh, first, uh, 
Uh, please, uh, Professor Hirono. Thank you very much. Second, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Wan Vimon. And our kind of, uh, moderator, Dr. Yawapa, Associate. Assistant Professor Dr. Yawapa. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Thirawat. And, and as for the online presenter, please come to Thailand to get your gift. <laughs> yeah, lastly, uh, may I ask the, the group photo, please? Uh, may I ask the, the online presenter to turn on your camera? So we will take photo together. And please come to Thailand to take the gift later. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Yang, please turn on your camera. Right. Thank you very much. So that's it. Uh, that's bring to the end of today's seminar. I hope you enjoy and have some ideas about the frontier of research, uh, fishery research and technology. So see you next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.